company that is fixing bread prices. Yeah. My good friend Joe, and he is a good friend, <laughs> he's received contributions from 44 billionaires. Pete, on the other hand, is trailing, Pete. You only got 39 billionaires contributing. So, Pete, we look forward to you. I know you're an energetic guy and a competitive guy to see if you can take on Joe on that issue. But what is not... What is What happened uh, is that some of our philosophers got off base. And one of the great problems of history is that the concepts of love and power have usually been contrasted as opposites, polar opposites. So that love is identified with a resignation of power and power with a denial of love. It was this misinterpretation that caused uh, the philosopher Nietzsche was the philosopher of the will to power, to reject the Christian concept of love. It was the same misinterpretation which induced Christian theologians to reject Nietzsche's philosophy of the will to power in the name of the Christian idea of love. Now we got to get this thing right. What is needed is a realization that power without love is reckless and abusive and that love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best. Power at its best is love. Implementing the demands of justice and justice at its best is love correcting everything that stands against love. Welcome to The Michael Brooks Show. I'm Michael Brooks. We're broadcasting live from downtown Brooklyn, USA, where we say solidarity with Glenn Greenwald with super producer Matt Leck. Hello. Chief economist David Griscom. How's it going? On this week's program, Justin Jackson. He's a running back for the LA Chargers. He's also a brilliant, dope political analyst on Twitter. And we're gonna talking about how he got into politics, what his thoughts on 2020 are, his insights on Libya. Very much looking forward to having him on the show. And then Brandon Sutton, BJ Sutton, host of The Discourse. He's joining us in studio. He hosts that excellent show, which you all should join. We're going to be talking about MLK's not only radical legacy, but this incredible synthesis of power and love that we all need to be looking at and thinking about right now, how to properly contextualize it. What does the fierce urgency of now mean in 2020? And also, we'll be touching on Joe Biden. Some choice interview clips from him today. We're gonna talk about Hillary Clinton. She's just trash. I've had great conversations with Jeffrey Epstein, Ghislaine Maxwell, and Harvey Weinstein. But Bernie Sanders is a grumpy Jew. Yeah. See you on Hulu. Uh, I poll very poorly on Little St. James Island. <laughs> yeah, exactly. To, to be fair, I will say on the, uh, the uh, uh, global pedophile island that Bill Clinton visited, I was not very popular. We will be talking about that and also why Elizabeth Warren's general election prospects are terrifying from a new analysis from Matt Karp. The new NAFTA, bad for the environment, the Luanda leaks, the Western role in oil corruption across the continent of Africa, and the failing New York Times folks, David Feldman. David Feldman of the amazing podcast, the Lib Whisperer. The Lib Whisperer. <laughs> David Feldman, host of the great podcast, David Feldman Show, also a writer, first and foremost for Triumph the Insult Comic Dog, will be joining us to explain the New York Times endorsement. 
And then of course we have a debunk and a whole bunch of other stuff to get to in the post game. Jam packed show. And uh, we'll get to the plug soon as well. And of course the shout out and the gem, you know it all. But first let's talk about Martin Luther King Jr. He continues to inspire and guide us for a lot of very, very important and salient reasons. So one is that we all need to continue each year and each day to sort of correct the record <laughs> about him. He was a radical. He was somebody fundamentally committed to human liberation, democracy, economic and racial justice, and anti-imperialism. He was extraordinary courageous in his, obviously his physical courage in his fight against American apartheid, against Jim Crow and for civil rights. He was enormously morally courageous to earn the scorn of liberal and establishment America by opposing the LBJ genocide, genocidal war on Vietnam. This was his true legacy. And the other thing was that he actually had an incredible theological mind. And as you saw in that cold open, a really deep and profound understanding of dialectics and different dynamics, the relationship between power and love that is elemental to getting it right today, politically, economically, morally, and spiritually. He created unity within a struggle for justice, but never was apologized for or was conciliatory for injustice. Many who want to defang his legacy by excluding the truly radical nature of his politics. Let's get a little reminder of those radicalism when it comes to economic justice here. We read one day, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But if a man doesn't have a job or an income, he has neither life nor liberty and the possibility for the pursuit of happiness. He merely exists. He didn't separate these struggles. He preached a synthesis that made clear that justice doesn't just mean absence of harm, but a sharing of power, political and economic. He also understood to achieve the society, we need a radical and core shift of our values. In his, beyond, in his address to the Riverside Church, Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break the Silence in 1967, he wrote this. He said this, I'm convinced that to get on the right side of the world revolution, me, we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly be begin. We must rapidly begin to shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. Where machines and profits when machines and computers, profit motives, and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism, and militarism are, inescape, are incapable of being conquered. This is a absolutely perfect diagnosis of Trump's America in 2020. And of course, where we've been for decades after the assassination of MLK and the FBI terror campaign against him and the entire civil rights movement. But this should make us think first about his full radical legacy and how we realize and achieve it today and who's carrying it on today in modern politics globally. Secondly, we need to look at the spiritual and philosophical message, regardless of whether or not you're a Christian or an atheist or anything else, Understanding those dynamics and understanding those ideas is fundamental to that value shift so that we don't replicate all of those poisonous patterns embodied in capitalism inside our own movements and dynamics. This is another deep insight he had. And it's also in embracing him fully as a person, not some sort of airbrush saint figure, a flawed, struggling, and incredibly courageous human being. With racism on the rise, U.S. militarism engaging endlessly overseas, there's no doubt that this revolution in values is deeply needed. And we also face a fundamental attack on our humanity 
from Silicon Valley, where they hope to turn us into algorithms, where the fusion of sort of micro customization and the complete elimination of, on one hand, this is what Evgeny Morozov has so brilliantly articulated. On one hand, a complete reduction to individual isolated atomized human experiences with a blind reductionist quote unquote objective metrics that eliminate historical, social, political, economic, and moral understandings. So on one hand, micro micro delivered experience just for you outside of community, outside of context. And on the other hand, the quote unquote mass objective deployment of, as an example, things like facial recognition technology, which as we all know, will be an enormous threat um, and an increasing of racism and the abuses of the criminal justice system, as well as an overall threat to already totally depleted privacy and civil liberties. We must break out of this isolation and the exhausted, destructive neoliberal capitalist ideology behind it. The hopelessness of capitalist realism that no real change is possible and that the decision making should be hand concentrated in the hands of the wealthy elite is a cultural idea that is pumped out by Silicon Valley and other prime predatory industries. We must do better and present a vision that strives to balance and synthesize love and power that knows how to build up while never compromising on the question of justice. There's no bread and role model for how to do it than the actual true and living revolutionary legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. Do you guys want to add anything to that? I just um, hit that, you know, I've had the opportunity to go back as, you know, I hope that many people were able to do and watch some of MLK's speeches and I think that he was really able to hit that that synthesis when he talked about racism and capitalism. Um, he had a, uh, the speech is, is escaping me right now, but he had this great speech talking about how, you know, there was no proper, like, you know, um, after slavery, there was not this, you know, the promise like 40 acres and a mule and this failure to basically allow, you know, black people to, in this country um, to be able to stand up on their own two feet. Meanwhile, at the same time, the United States government um, was pushing its army through the West and literally giving away land to white settlers, mm -hmm. right? So this right. idea that like- In the well, wake of genociding- Of course, Americans. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, but this idea, um, you know, that the US government doesn't help out people, doesn't help out like large po sections of the population is completely false. And he's able to do that in a way that I think was very constructive, uh, where he's able to highlight like, yes, there is economic justice and there is racial justice. And oftentimes, you know, those two things are going to uh, hit ahead without um, this kind of false consciousness that some people think this like these are two separate issues. Um, and then when they talk about, you know, racial cap racialized capitalism, they lose um, the kind of grand narrative of like the American capital system. We've been, uh, this project of sort of de uh, mythologizing and historicizing MLK to sort of reveal the uh, economic egalitarian side of him. We feel like we're winning that. Don't we over the last like yeah, decade or so? I like, think so. I think it's def like that conversation changed a lot. I feel like even just in my conscious living memory. Definitely. Of it. I agree. Also an incredible tactician. I mean, you know, his understanding of media, his understanding that the, why they're all, you know, they're wearing suits, they're, you know, how things were presented and interpreted visually is another great and brilliant hard-headed hard tactic that we need to learn from him as well. All right, let's go to the shout out. Which one do you want? Uh, well, which, uh, you know, uh, tickle me with a feather. Your, your shout out, shout out, shout out. My brain is still in recovery mode. Shout out, shout out. Shout this is the uh, nervous. My brain is right? still in recovery yeah, mode. mode. Shout out, shout out. Oh, we so should have died. Could somebody get the uh, meme that Ad and shout out did from taking in so many high uh, level reports? Let's find that. The dialogue like should be on. Like, I like talking about Twitter ideas. Time. High level. The exchange of ideas. Shout out, shout out. High level. Out. Still in recovery mode. Recovery mode. Recovery mode. Looking forward to uh, sharing more ideas. <laughs> <laughs> that always sells it. So last week we talked about Moms for Housing in Hokeland, uh, who had been highlighting the homelessness crisis and the predatory nature of the real estate industry. And they were targeting one particular uh, real estate speculator that specialized in flipping houses. And the uh, police were called on them. 
there was a violent and brutal response that removed them from the home and their accurate diagnosis of the injustice and physical courage galvanized a lot of people across the country in solidarity with their incredible activism. Let's follow up on that. And there's obviously infinitely more to go, including things like we need immediately, like national rent control, like serious public housing option, and so on. Uh, but this is a great win for Moms for Housing, which is this incredible group in Oakland. They have apparently reached a good faith agreement. I'm going to read from their tweet now. A good faith agreement has been reached to sell the vacant home, a vacant the vacant Oakland house that several homeless mothers used as a residence for nearly two months before being evicted last week in a contentious dispute with law enforcement. And then it opens to a San Francisco Chronicle article. Let's open that. Moms for Housing deal, reached deal to, oh, you, it's, oh man. All right. Anyways, the point is, is that they've, re, they have reached I want people to keep following this because it's a tenant, you know, it's it's an agreement in principle to basically of this for the sale of the West Oakland house to a nonprofit um, that would basically keep the mothers in this home under a quote. I'm quoting that from the article under a quote, good faith agreement. It's the second paragraph. You could scroll down announced Monday Wedgwood Properties, which is the real estate predator, which specializes in house flipping, will negotiate the sale with the Oakland Community Land Trust, a nonprofit organization that acquires land and property and property for affordable housing, said the office of Mayor Libby Schaaf. Schaaf helped arrange the deal that requires the three bedroom, one bath house on 2928 Magnolia Street to sell for no more than its appraised value. And, and there's going to be some other steps that need to take place. We need to stay very closely on this issue. But again, this is an example of people power. This is an example of human courage in the face of human exploitation, capitalist exploitation, and a victory. We can win, and we must win. Shout out to Moms for Housing in Oakland. That's awesome. All right, this is the meme that I think it was Ad Infintium. Is that right? I love this one. This is so good. One second. Uh, no, it's not Greta Thunberg. <laughs> okay. Ad infinitum. All right, this is, I love it. If you're, if you're watching, if you're listening, I'll say at the top, we've got very classical, classically stupid Dave Rubin going Bolsonaro and then uh, Bolsonaro. <laughs> One more time. Uh, Bolsonaro. <laughs> and then a beaming Brian Meir and myself as I shake hands with the man himself, Lula da Silva. Um, we'll, of course, talk about the disgraceful and illegitimate persecution by the Brazilian regime that they are attempting on Glenn Greenwald, all solidarity with Glenn Greenwald. Glenn responded to these charges in typical fearless fashion. Um, but let's do a little bit of a t uh, pitch, and then we're going to get to our friend Justin Jackson. Guys, lead us through the pitch a little bit. Talk about why they should become patrons. Talk about all of the insane amounts, really two to one bonus content they get. They get the whole TMBS experience. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, becoming, you know, become a patron and you'll have access to not only the post game, which we do immediately after this show, where you can call in and ask questions um, through our IM service and things like that. We also are creating illicit histories and uh, Sunday shows that come out every Sunday. There's a really interesting one coming up with uh, Daniel Bessner on the different futures that are available to us going forward. Um, we are able to take deep dives into politics and history. On Mondays, I do a quick reading list where you're able to jump into different kinds of uh, socialist and left-wing philosophy and history. And, uh, you know, we're also building this, this whole movement and we're continuing to grow. And we've only been able to do that because of everyone's support. And, you know, seriously, if you're enjoying this content, you're going to get triple the amount. And you're also going to support the show, which is a very important thing to do. It's incredibly important. That's how we can do, you know get out everything from correcting the record on like the Sanders campaign to introducing people to say uh, Thomas Sankara or the work of Milton Alamati. Matt. 
Uh, you also get early access to our live show announcements, like the one that we have on February 7th uh, at the Bell House in Brooklyn here. Yes, guys, we're in that crunch phase now where the tickets are growing incredibly quickly. There's only a handful of VIP tickets left. So definitely, if you want VIP, buy them tonight. And then, I don't know. Um, you know, we sold out Philly. We're on a similar trajectory with this one. So I would go snag them as quickly as possible and not take the risk of mixing of missing it. I'm so excited. The great, the amazing Alona Minkowski. Our, one of our guides, Harvey K. Our buddy Ben Burgess. Brandon Sutton, who's coming here tonight. Brilliant. The Discourse is one of the smartest podcasts in the game. And he's a really funny guy. Uh, and then, of course, Matt Binder, host of Doomed, another podcast you should definitely check out. And some, I mean, frankly, some nostalgia for a certain type of head out there. So grab your tickets today. And then let's go to tmbs.fm for just a second. We're going to do, because we've been really light. I want to just uh, talk a little bit more here about the pitches. All right. Within um, uh, the book is I was actually just finalizing covers for the Zero Books uh, book, Against the Web, The Cosmopolitan Socialist Answer to the New Right, is coming out in either late February or early March at the latest. You can check out on the website a blurb page. We've got blurbs from the greats. I mean, some really heavy hitters. Anna Kasparian, Glenn Greenwald, Bill Fletcher Jr., Marissa Baradarin, and Crystal Ball. I'm totally honored uh, by you know such brilliant on-point people. Then we've got our catalog here. We are going to be mailing out, for those of you, there's already been plenty of orders. We're mailing stuff out beginning early next week, and we're also going to have gear for people to buy at the Bell House live show. And the next live show, I'll give you a date. It's April 3rd. Who it's with and where it's at, we're going to be announcing tomorrow. When you buy this gear, first of all, it looks good. Uh, Lula liked it. His girlfriend threw on the hoodie during the interview. It was so bad. We were like in the middle of an interview. And I think if I was interviewing anybody else besides Lula, I would have been like, can somebody get a picture, please? Um, and then, of course, you know, these are either um, the one that we couldn't union produce is living wage, full benefits, good conditions. And then everything else is union made. Um, buy it. Helps the show. Helps us grow out. Do a lot of things we need to do, including things like the video illicit histories. TMBS.fm to get all the information you need, including the clothing catalog, patreon.com slash TMBS to become a member today. And if you are watching this and you haven't yet, for God's sake, click subscribe and click the bell so you get the notifications. And if you want, hit us with a super chat because YouTube is effing us royally this month, as they do, of course, all independent media creators. Um, so we are well off track for our YouTube goals, which again, which is why first and foremost, become a patron. That's the way the whole thing works. That's the way the business is. That's the way the movement moves. Um, but if you can, you know, uh, help us at least sort of equalize the YouTube stuff because it is important, even though the platform is problematic. All right, folks, we're gonna take a brief break. We'll be right back with Justin Jackson political commentator running back for the LA Chargers. Welcome back to the Michael Brooks show. Joining us now, it's a pleasure to welcome for the first time on this show, Justin Jackson. He's a running back for the LA Chargers. He's um, an educator of Nira Tandon on Twitter and many other <laughs> things. Justin, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Appreciate you having me on. Justin, I mean, I just got, how did you get into politics and I, I just want to say maybe we'll talk for a little bit about this near Tannen thing because I don't spend a lot mm -hmm. of time on this show like recounting like Twitter beefs and battles and stuff like that but what really jumped out about mm -hmm. that one was that you schooled her on Libya yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, talk about it right so how did I get into politics well it really was in the 2016 election. I was, what, 18 at the time? Mm -hmm. um, and the school I went to, Northwestern, you know, there's a lot of very, you know, socially conscious, not as much politically conscious, but, I mean, at that age, you're kind of just coming to your own politically, um, kind of breaking away from that thought of just like, oh, whatever my parents are is what I am, right? Um, but because we have a lot of those conversations in the locker room and, 
And because obviously it was such a huge spectacle, you know, obviously with Trump being a nominee against Hillary, I wanted to do a lot more research because when we would have those discussions, I really didn't have anything knowledgeable, like politically, historically to bring to the table as far as like policy, you know, votes, all that type of stuff. I didn't really know any of that. And if you watch mainstream media, you won't know any of that because they yeah. they don't talk about any of that stuff. All they ever talk about was Trump's tweets and all that type of stuff. Um, really, basically just like TMZ or E! News. Like that's basically what mainstream media was at the time. Yeah. So I had to go to independent media to actually get educated on a lot of these different topics um, so I could you know, bring you know, knowledge to a discussion. And that's really what motivated me. Um, and unfortunately, it was after the primary. Um, obviously, if I had been paying attention before the primary, I would have been a strong supporter of Bernie. Um, but it was, it was really a, uh, kind of an awakening for me because I, I figured out that, you know, a lot of the stuff that Hillary had voted for and what she supported, I didn't agree with, you know what I mean? And I'm like sitting here like, oh, I think I'm a Democrat, but I don't agree with any of, right. any of the stuff that she's done and all the stuff she's pushed. So like, what am I, you know what I mean? So it was kind of like that political awakening to, to kind of find out that, you know, I agreed with Bernie's platform and a really progressive uh, policy uh, proposals and that type of stuff. So that's kind of how I came to my own politically. Before we get to this thing, can you um, talk a little bit more of like what, what's going on in those locker room conversations? Like what are people talking about and thinking about? Because, you know, first of all, that's mm -hmm. just interesting in and of itself, like any conversations people are having on the job. And I think also yeah. a lot of people are noticing that in general, like, Sports are getting very political again. Um, and there's so many yeah. cases where people in sports, I think, are making better calls like than, you know, yeah. any other like pop culture industry, basically. So, like, what are those conversations yeah. like? What are people talking about? What are they saying? What are they thinking? How broad a range are the opinions? It's actually it's actually pretty broad, you know, um, and. I think it's a little different now in the NFL. Um, we don't have as much time. Uh, you know, when we're at work, we are working most of the time. Um, and, you know, people have families and stuff afterwards. A lot of people, you know, you go back with your family. You have a few buddies you hang out with on the team. But college is really different because you're around those guys. You're living with those guys. You're eating with those guys. You're in class with those guys. Workouts all off season. You know, you're in the locker room for a lot of time. So you get really, really close with these guys. And then you kind of get more comfortable having these discussions. Um, and like I said, the, a lot of the discussions we had, at least in Northwestern locker room, were much more s about social issues, um, as opposed to political issues. Like I said, I don't think a lot of people at that age, we just hadn't paid attention to closely yet. Mm -hmm. Um, but they were, they, I mean, they could turn into yelling matches. Um, you know, a lot of people would bring up some stuff that, uh, some other people didn't know, and then, and then uh, you know, the other side's like, ooh, I don't really know how to respond to that <laughs> type thing. Yeah. So yeah. it was it was really interesting, and the dichotomy was there uh, between, you know, people that were technically, like, socially conservative-leaning. You know, we had a lot of guys from the, the South, Texas, Georgia, Florida. Um, and then obviously, we had a lot of guys from California and, uh, you know, obviously Chicago, and just more liberal, you know, New York, more liberal places. So there was an interesting dichotomy uh, present. Um, so I, I definitely, that was like my first introduction to kind of debating issues and um, actually trying to bring knowledge to those debates. So you, I mean, it's tough to say you're going to win a debate because like, I mean, we're all brothers. We all love each other and everything, but we really do have differences on issues. But it's, it's, all, it's always good to actually bring some knowledge into those debates, and that's kind of what has informed me, and I've done all this research, so that's kind what of what you What did you, sorry to interrupt, too, but like, what did you, when you started looking out and doing your own research, what, what did you start reading yeah. and watching and listening to? Yeah, like I said, I, I really started uh, with, you know, like, independent media sources, um, not only in print, but video. Um, so, uh, you know, like TYT, mm -hmm. uh, like Secular Talk, like Sam Show, um, and then as far as like print sources, more like the Intercept, the Nation, just like, you know, actual, you know, places where like Democracy Now!, like places where I actually felt like they were giving some actual insight into to issues and not just kind of talking about character flaws of Trump or, or Hillary, you know what I mean? So I think that's something that really informed me because 
I didn't, I really wanted to know like what the urge for people to, to vote for someone like Trump, um, like what the urge was for that, like what the urge was behind that, you know, that, uh, that inclination. Cause obviously those character flaws are there, but people were really to look past that. And I wanted to know why. And so I had to actually go into the history politically and what really brought us as America to that moment in 2016, um, to where we had the choice between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, obviously two of the most uh, despised politicians, uh, favor, favor, uh, favorability rating wise that we've ever had. So I definitely want to dig more, dig deeper into, into, you know, why we got to that point. How did you start arguing with Neera Tandon about Libya? So (laughs) Neera, Neera, I think is a very polarizing figure, um, within the, within the democratic party. Um, but I think, and obviously she's been an advisor to Hillary for a long time. And she was one of the main Bernie bashers, uh, main bashers of the left, main bashers of anyone who dared to criticize, you know, her queen, Hillary Clinton. Um, but what was so telling, or what is so telling about Mira, and it, it even showed, and after I tweeted her and everything, is she just immediately blocked me, right? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. it's this, this elitist groupthink that has, like, okay, I don't know you, you're not in my circle, so your voice doesn't matter, I'm just going to block it out, right? And that's really that ideology is what um, Hillary's campaign was kind of running on, right? Like, once Bernie was out of the primary, um, it was kind of like, all right, whatever those progressive issues Bernie was pushing for, whatever they're done, we're going to run on fracking, we're going to run on fracking, we're going to run on you know, just improve Obamacare, we're going to run on, or we can't even get to a $15 minimum wage, you know, Hillary Clinton gets $500,000 for a one hour speech, but you're, you don't deserve $15 an hour for honest work. Like all that type of stuff. They kind of just threw that to the yeah. side and thought, well, you know, Trump's on the other side. So you have to vote for me. Um, and so just that, that, the, that, that mode of thinking is something that I think she embodies. And also just that whole wing of the party, um, that centrist wing of the party, elite wing of the party, kind of embodies, and I think she's the per- perfect personification for that. And you also, pu- I mean, you pulled this thing based off of a WikiLeaks uh, mm-hmm. revealed, you know, document that basically she was talking, right. and you know, whatever, I guess, kind of flippantly, not in a policy setting, but like essentially that the Libyans should pay us back for overthrowing Gaddafi uh, with oil. Mm-hmm. Now, right. I don't know, like. Does she mean like the Libyans that now are openly buying and selling human beings and restored slave markets? Right. Like, I mean, they might have some capital to throw around. Does she mean the like, you know, the warlord in one part of the country or the government that's tentatively or, you know, the different right. factions that are fighting proxy war between, you know, Turkey and Russia right now? I don't know who we're talking about, but that kind of mindset I, I i i it caught me one because again it was it was a deep catch you know that isn't like yeah. just a standard like you know oh you say this but you know this poll number is different or whatever that really matters yeah. you know and also yeah. that was something that people said about iraq all the time i mean that actually used to be like a, an acceptable liberal position i think dick yeah. durbin used to say that like hey we went in there we did this job they should give us the oil not even considering right. like, well, nobody asked you to, in, you know, invade or, you know, very few people did. And you actually, you know, killed a lot of people, caused a lot of problems by doing these things. Right. Yeah, exactly. So the destabilization of the Middle East, um, which has been obviously caused by United States foreign policy over the last few decades, has been something that has just completely bankrupted our country. And not to speak of the thousands, if not millions of lives that not only have been affected, but people that have died um, overseas. And then you have people like Mir Tannen talking about repayment through oil, which, like you said, all these different factions are in Libya right now. So it's really not any type of repayment. It's just we're just going to take those resources um, from that country, uh, which is really why we wanted to overthrow Gaddafi in the first place is like why we want to overthrow any um, dictator, I put that in air quotes, um, because they're trying to nationalize the oil and, and reap those profits for their own people, which is why you see why we're trying to, they were trying to overthrow um, the Venezuelan government and why, you know, they're trying to, you know, overthrow the, the Iranian government, right? So these are very, and, and it's like the same playbook, right? And so now we see 
Like you can't, before they can do that, they could kind of work in back rooms and back channels, but really through the rise of social media and shows like yours and other independent media sources, people are actually getting real news that, you know, you won't see on, on the corporate media channel. So now we can actually see that. And now we actually have a president that will just go on TV and say, yeah, we were going in there to take the oil. Right. Right. And so it's almost right. good that we can, we can see that at face value and then fight back against that. Um, and obviously Nira and, and them, those emails really revealed how they think, right? Because they have all these, you know, back channels and ways of talking about stuff that don't reach the public because they've already modified the message so much. But we really got to have an inside look into how they think about these things and really just the corruption and rot that is, that is within that elitist neoliberal um, group thing. You feeling the burn? Oh, hundred percent. hundred percent. Talk about it. Hundred percent. Um, I really think, and I, I truly believe this. I think Bernie is the only um, candidate we have right now that can save America from going off the cliff that we, I believe, we're driving towards. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because these corporate neoliberal policies mixed with neocon far right wing reactionary policies have pushed the country to such a point where however many people over 70% live paycheck to paycheck, people can't afford their insulin. They, you know, they're crippled with student debt. You know, I have a lot of family members. My dad's still paying off student debt. He went to DeVry technical school and he's right. going to be 50. <laughs> he's still paying off. Yeah. Student. Like it's unbelievable. Yeah. It's, unbelievable. it's really unbelievable. So yep. all these different things that Americans are, are, you know, stressed, all the stress that they have to deal with because of finances are because of a policy that have been pushed by our government really since the 80s when you start uh, trickle down economics and Reaganomics and all the tax cuts and all that type of stuff. So I really think Bernie is the only candidate pushing a platform with a movement behind him that can really enact the change, the urgent change we need um, to move forward, not to mention climate change, which obviously is a, is a huge, that crisis is a, is a huge thing looming very near in the, in the, in the future. So I really think that um, Bernie's the only one that's going to be able to do that. And it's really not a cult of personality. And that's what I think a lot of people love about Bernie is he's just him, right? He's this yeah. like kind of disgruntled old man who has just been fighting for the same things for 30, 40 years, but finally people are starting to listen to him. And it's in, and, and, and I just love the, just the direction of his campaign because he's bringing so many people in who weren't before weren't paying attention or, or just stopped believing in politics, stop believing in, in the, you know, that change can actually happen uh, from the government level through a movement of the people. So I just really love that. Um, just the aura around his, uh, around his campaign and, and the, and the really that, that the diversity of his campaign and, and how it's a working class, you know, poor people driven campaign. That's awesome. I hope they do a video with you if you're up for it. I think you put it as good as it could be put. Let me, first of all, I want to thank you, man. And I hope that you'll come back on again. And I just want to ask you oh, yeah, for sure. two for sure. quick questions before you run off. Sure. Um, on the off season, if you ever come to New York, please come in studio and hang out with us. Um, David sure. Griscom would like to challenge you to a push up contest. <laughs> I just wanted to relay that to you. <laughs> I mean, that's on him. I'm pretty good at that, but yeah, I would think so. But you know, look, hey, I, you know, so, but that's just for David. I don't, I don't feel I can do push-ups, absolutely, but I'm not challenging you. That's just David is challenging you on that. That's number one. So you're all right. Athletic challenge, let's do it. I'm down. All right, so he's up for push-up contest with you, David. And then uh, I hesitate to ask you this, but is that it for the Patriots, man? Is the era over? Oh man, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. It seems like Brady's ready to move on, which is which. Really, what's so interesting about that is right. He's won six championships there. Like, think about that. He's won six championships there, and him and the coach still don't get along. That is wild to me. That is crazy. Like, <laughs> that I think is that pretty wild. Gives you an insight into Bel into Belichick and his mindset, and it's, it's it's different, man. The Patriots they're a different organization, but that's why they're so successful. So we'll see. It's gonna be a it might be a shakeup this year when it comes to uh, this office when it comes to quarterbacks. So it'll definitely be interesting to watch. That's politics right there. <laughs> exactly. Very very <laughs> political answer, my friend. 
<laughs> I think about these things. <laughs> <laughs> Justin Jackson, I really, really appreciate your time, man. And obviously running back for the LA Chargers and definitely some of the people should be following on Twitter and somebody who thinks, you know, really clearly about politics. Um, and it's awesome. Justin, thanks, man. Yeah, man. I appreciate you, Mike. You guys have a good show. All right? Absolutely. Take care. Ready, David? <laughs> Maybe it's That's bo- very dangerous. <laughs> just both me and David versus it. But we should all just do it. Let's just do like all Justin three, versus all three, TMBS. All three, all three yeah. And then we'll just, uh, just the contest for runner up. That will be where all the energy is. That'll be really Oh, no. Funny. I meant we all combine our totals. Oh, we all combine our totals so he can beat us in a landslide. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. All right. Uh, look, it's time for a gem. Yeah. Um, hold on. You got it? Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. I like that. A little more high energy. You want to try it? Try it. Try the high energy version. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, do that. All right. It doesn't work. I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, no. So, I mean, I wanted to talk about, uh, you know, there's two big trade stories that have been going on this week. Um, and we got to hit them because there's a lot of nonsense going on. So, first, let's talk about China and this you know, what they're calling the phase one agreement, which is essentially just a truce um, between the United States and China. Obviously, they've been hitting each other with tariffs and really threatening a lot of, you know, economic instability. So, you know, let's really think about what's going on underneath the scenes. First, let's start with Silicon Valley. From the very beginning, this fight with China has really been about technology. They say there's a lot of other issues, but it's about Silicon Valley corporations wanting to have their intellectual property and basically their right to have, you know, monopoly stakes um, in the global economy protected by the United States is, uh, you know, powerful political position. And the fact is, is that China is, you know, a massive economy with a growing tech sector. And of course, that there is going to be conflict between the United States and competition with the United States. So the assumption that, and this was, Richard Wolf talked about this too when he was on the show, this sort of implicit deal with China and U.S. tech companies was, right. we're going to, div- you know, you guys can come here and exploit our labor, but we're also going to start learning a little bit and like have, you know, access to technology and build our own growing tech se- sector. And now that China is starting to threaten that, you know, now there's all this, oh, my God, the Chinese are thieves and they're stealing. I'm not saying that everything that the Chinese are doing, by the way, is like above water. But it's this like the general (laughs) assumption that there's something super malicious about Chinese strategy is absolutely wrong. So what happens when Trump comes in is that Trump, you know, just bumbles around and makes a complete fool of himself and really just pushes this conflict to a head and has created this disastrous situation. Um, but the fact is, is that even with this deal, the one of the most important things was that China agreed to a lot more, you know, that they're going to self-police themselves much more when it comes to United States intellectual property for the benefit of Silicon Valley corporations. And let's remember that technology um, specifically is an industry that's very good at protecting its own profits. And it's not the kind like that trickles down well at all. Um, so, you know, there's been a lot of behind the scenes. It's a where pure st- artificial scarcity. Yeah, yeah, you know, and it's like in a lot of like the tech companies, you know, have been behind the scenes sort of lobbying the Trump, you know, government and like a lot of the things that Trump has been doing for them on, on the long term are probably be beneficial. Um, you know, and just real quick, too, let's also not forget that, you know, this conflict with China has been boiling for a long time under the water. Um, Obama pushed the, you know, had the pivot to Asia. And the idea there was that even though there's all these countries that are mainly trading partners of China, the United States was going to use its political power to, you know, reassert itself. And that's what was behind TPP. And lastly, with, with regards to China, um, you know, the fact is, is that you know, we're seeing a massive trade slowdown. And that was because globalization drove that. And what was the main function? Of, what was like the one of the driving forces behind globalization was this access to cheap labor in Asia. And what we're seeing is we're actually seeing slowdowns in production across these low wage areas because it was sort of like a blip that sort of happened um, in, in these areas that were very much underdeveloped. And as they start to get developed, that model doesn't work as well. And lastly, about, uh, you know, this whole 
conversation with the global trade with China um, and Asia in general is that when we talk about trade, we need to be talking about climate change. And the fact is, is that the reason that this model worked at all was because we were shipping everything across the Pacific. And that eats up an incredible amount of energy. And it really has, you know, not just like the oil, right. but like the production itself is a huge, um, you know, impact on, has a huge impact on climate change. And of course, Donald Trump and, the, and all these people will have no interest in that. Now, I just want to get to this as well, too. NAFTA 2 um, is another great example of this. Talking problem. more about this in the post game. Yeah. You know, just hitting it real quick is Bernie yeah, Sanders is 100% um, correct to call out the, uh, you know, the failure of this deal to address climate change. Let's also not forget that even though people like Elizabeth Warren are saying, well, we shouldn't throw out a deal that has mild improvements because it's not perfect. Let's not forget that these deals fundamentally just put corporate corporations and corporate rights above nations. And, you know, if we want to implement the kind of programs that Bernie Sanders wants to uh, implement, these deals will be a problem and it will be something that we will have to fight against. And that's why Bernie Sanders is absolutely correct uh, to oppose them. Um, the fact is, is that this economic model is not going to be able to revive itself under the old rules of capitalism. It's not going to be able to revive itself through ridiculous trade deals like NAFTA II. Um, Bernie Sanders is 100% right to oppose it. And this is a great example um, of the different trajectory that this leftist, this democratic socialist movement is pushing. Because we see this deal, it gets bipartisan support. And when you have bipartisan support, that should be something that should make you very nervous. Um, it's exactly what this whole deal has been about was the status quo, which is that you know corporations are running policy in Washington. And you can see that synthesis and that unity when the Democratic Party doesn't even make us think about Donald Trump, somebody who they're literally trying to impeach. They give him everything it want, he wants when it comes to global trade and the economy. Well, you know, they decry his attitudes and his you know behavior or whatever, but no, no fundamental difference in structure. Yeah, I mean, it makes me think of two things I want to maybe just riff on for a few minutes. One we'll get to in a second, which is China and Belt and Road, which mm. we're going to talk about more in the show. But yeah, I mean, just the incredible incoherence around impeachment. Mm -hmm. And I say that as somebody who, you know, I've said I'm on record that it's like, sure, I, I, I think, you know, I think it's probably the right call. I love the idea of monopolizing his time. I think if it was done in the right strategic way, it could make him bleed. And also, let's be really clear, too, he is bleeding to some extent. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump's a very unpopular president, right? Like, people need to Nobody remind themselves him. of that. <laughs> Nobody, <laughs> Nobody likes him. Well, actually... She's one of the only people that people like less than yeah. Donald Trump, speaking of which, which we will get to that nightmare in a couple of minutes. But the uh, the uh, there's a variety of grounds of critique. Right. So one is, you know, why are we not why are we not impeaching Donald Trump for having concentration camps, mm -hmm. terrorizing migrants? Why are we not? Which, in fact, that is precisely the part of his administration, which we can use Gestapo, Nazi, and fascist terminology around without flinching. Um, disgusting. Crimes against humanity committed by all of these obscene people. Uh, then, of course, you know, the questions of the, uh, 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 I can't pronounce it right now. Emoluments. Uh, emoluments clause and mm -hmm. personal corruption, all of that stuff. Um, you know, and then, of course, objectively, this phone call, what he did is obviously, um, you know, of course is wrong. In fact, mm -hmm. even people who go really hard against both our policy in Eastern Europe and the political wisdom of going after Trump in this way, all admit that it's wrong. Mm -hmm. So none of this is on the table. But the first and more substantive problem is how the Democrats have chosen to go at him without those two other much more primary and serious issues. And the other thing being, again, is just this, we have a slew of things. We've got NAFTA too. Mm -hmm. We've got them reauthorizing the Patriot Act. We've got them giving him a space force. Mm -hmm. So we actually have even the bureaucratic building blocks, which are already in place, of an increasingly authoritarian state, of a fusion of the national security state and Silicon Valley and absolutely unprecedented, dangerous, alarming, uh, and frankly, terrifying ways, all signed off on by a majority of corporate Democrats, which is we know just as Democrats, mm -hmm. even as the hyperventilating about this stuff. Now, again, the dialectic, because I don't want to say that there's nothing there and yada, yada, yada. But it really does. It's extraordinary to me. But, and I say that as somebody who, you know, everybody in this room, 
We take beating Donald Trump more seriously than Paul Krugman does, mm -hmm. which is why we want to be clear about Joe Biden's record as an example. I, I would just add to just, I mean, you know, just generally about impeachment is that when it comes down to what the political process for actually impeaching a president is, right, there's still a lot of questions of like, you know, the actual like removal from office when it comes to the president. And in my opinion, you're not going to be able to do that unless you can make a case that is so strong that it actually like invigorates so many American people that they are also demanding for the president, you know, to step down, to get out of office. Or at the very least, it's seriously making and, them believe. But the way that the Democrats yeah. have pushed this impeachment, um, yeah. It's so technical. It's so. I mean, there's a certain group of people who like it. People who like, you know, long legal dramas, maybe. But you know, for the average American, it's not. It's these are the crimes that they're bringing up, and there's plenty of crimes that you could bring up that would, have, you know, have this reaction with people. They're just. They're not the kind of thing that inspires that anger and that frustration that is going to be necessary to pursue at a successful impeachment. And there's a reason for that. It's because the crimes that Donald Trump is guilty of are crimes that, for the most part, allegedly the, of the Democrat party are also complicit in um, and they don't want to draw political attention to that and you know that's a political reality that we have to face right now I think that I'd, I mean I'm all happy to see Donald Trump impeached don't get me wrong at all but you see who's driving it and this massive problem yeah right? the, I, I listened to um, to do my due diligence as a producer um, I listened to the New York Times impeachment po uh, podcast once one episode um, it had Emily Bazelon strong on it. producing and the, the, <laughs> the, hey man, I take my job seriously. I listened to one episode of the time. It was terrifying because they talked about that whole thing about the decision to keep it narrowly focused on this Ukraine stuff when there's a whole bunch of different things they could and just add. And what did they it. say about that? And all they could say to it was, I understand why some pe Emily Bazelon said this. I understand why some people are, uh, you know, upset about this, but this is the way that they're going to go. Okay, so there's just no, no actual, like, analysis into what that is. Um, right. Mainly because, like, Democrats are, like, cucks, basically. Yeah, they're um, and And the other thing, too, that I just couldn't, you know... You gotta just make one more quick, yeah, quick point, ahead. which is that then they moved on to like, well, what does this all mean? And so I'm like, okay, here's what this means. And then it's like, well, now we wait to see what the polls do. And if this looks good enough for Democrats, maybe we get three or four more to like be gung ho about or whatever mm -hmm. it was. Right. And it's like, this is, we're already just poll watching already in this process. I mean, that's what it is. And then of course we know, like, so no Republicans going to vote for this. And if I had to put money down, cinema and mansion will vote against it. Mm -hmm. So how do we, and possibly doug jones definitely cinema cinema and mansion are two of the worst people in u.s politics like we're gonna need to get to know them because they are horrible <laughs> they are political you know public enemies so you know how will it then play when trump can run around the country saying like two democrats two democrats and people won't know of course that these are you know extreme far-right politicians with you know, pro-Trump records. Mm -hmm. I also, I also just think that um, during one of the hearings, there were all of these law professors coming out and 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 doing like you know, including real melodramatic like you tell Russia to butt out of our election stuff. <laughs> yeah. And and here's the thing. I think there's definitely people who identify on the left who actually really underestimate the profound importance that even if we're in, even if liberal democracy is a fiction, that maintaining that fiction is protecting a lot of important things, if that makes sense. So it's, there's, there's degrees of things and ripping the mask off completely harms a lot of people. Now it makes things more transparent about how structurally harmful everything is. But I'm not somebody who wants to just say like, yeah, man, like whatever, who cares, right? Like there are, and when I first talked to the people from like the Workers' Party in Brazil, that was the first thing they were saying, like, yeah, you guys have circuit breakers going back hundreds of years. We're a modern republic created in the late 80s. We don't have the level of institutional protection, possibly. Mm -hmm. And as much as it's the wrong political strategy, um, you know, there were plenty of courts that initially rejected the Muslim ban as an example, right? So I want to always put that in the mix. But at the same time, watching very highly respected legal minds and intellectuals sitting there talking like they got their moment on some type of like grade C TV drama mm -hmm. about the Russians and our democracy. Let me just say even really narrowly, I don't even need to go to socialist grounds. 
you could still be talking about that after Bush v. Gore when we saw a presidential election get stolen. Mm -hmm. One candidate not only won the popular vote, but Al Gore would have won Florida if it was popularly vote counted. And the Supreme Court, they used a reading of the 14th Amendment, which they're constantly trying to undermine so they can go after civil rights cases. And they even mm -hmm. wrote, people should look up this lead decision, they even wrote in the lead decision like, don't use this for for, for future cases. This is a one-off mm -hmm. <laughs> that we are using to protect George W. Bush's civil rights about quote unquote double standards and voting count. If you can, a couple of decades after that, not to mention, of course, the research from Princeton about how we're not in a democracy, all this stuff, and still just be like, the answer is you butt out, Mr. Putin. <laughs> I, it's not only embarrassing, it's terrifying because it really does show that in the liberal mindset, there is an analogous set of delusions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. To I, the conservative one. No, I mean, I think there's no doubt about it. And, you know, what we're seeing right now is, I mean, even just watching this, you know, I know we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but watching this whole grand parade of like the New York Times endorsement, like there has been, oh, no, but like there has been like a real loss of, of like strategy and like understanding of politics or even understanding the political moment right now. And this, I just, I just feel like this impeachment um, fail, you know, what it, it, I feel like Donald Trump is like a once in a lifetime opposite, uh, opportunity for an opposition party right. because he's like so obviously corrupt. He's so obviously evil. He's so obviously wicked. He's so obviously incompetent. Mm -hmm. And you see the failure of the people who are in control of the Democratic Party to be able to use this as an opportunity to benefit themselves. And, and I, as somebody who watches politics closely, it's endlessly frustrating as somebody who cares about people in this country who is so worried um, when you see these kind of horrible racist uh, attacks that have been, you know, growing under Donald Trump and these movements to attack, you know, Iranian people and Muslim yep. people. I mean, it's very frightening. And and they don't even oppose him on Iran or yeah. Venezuela. I mean, we we I, we were just talking about the policy set. You have a co-signing on surveillance state, warmongering, and corporate friendly trade deals that don't don't even mention climate. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, but oh, you know, butt out, Mr. Putin. <laughs> it's it's insane. It's mm -hmm. it's. I mean, it's it's honestly, it's it is so delusional. And, you know, you get, I'm glad you brought up the Times endorsement. We'll talk about it more later. But it's like, you know, this Bernie Sanders stuff, sure, don't. Of course, you're not going to endorse Bernie Sanders, obviously. Mm. You represent a totally different class position. But you can't just say that somebody who has worked for decades in the legislative branch of government you know, like it's just, I mean, it's just, it's just incredible. Like, oh, yeah. oh, what are you going to do to pass an agenda? Well, I'm going to mobilize people in a civic shared uh, struggle to engage in their democratic process. Whoa. Hello, Pol Pot. Yeah. I mean, I mean it's, it's just so it's, irresponsible. It's so, I don't, I mean, honestly, I do think it's irresponsible. I do think much of it is malicious and in bad faith, but I think also a, a legitimate amount of it is, is genuinely stupid. Mm. It is genuinely people who have not read books who have gone to certain professional training institutions where they learn to mouth a bunch of cliches mm -hmm. and write the right responses on papers and that's it. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, I went to school in DC and I know a lot of those people, not you know, necessarily people who are at the New York Times editorial board, but like the asp the aspiring you, the aspiring, you know, aspiring. And, and it really is amazing that, you know, people do learn a kind of script It's like, oh, you know, you're not able to change anything. You know, the only way to get things done is by incremental smart policy, right? Even though you can look at you can point to, you know, point out to those people that the left's trajectory for the past 30 years has been that let's do smart um, middle of the road, nothing too radical, nothing too crazy, you know, political tinkering on the edges. And that's how we'll build like this great society. And, and, and there's just this complete ignorance of, of the history. Instead, it's a kind, you know what it is? I mean, it's really not to get too like psychoanalytic about it. But no, it's really dude. like, you know, you want the, um, 
you want the approval of the person in power. So like these kids, they go to schools right. that like, you know, their universities, especially, especially like political science departments and economics departments are just so pushed, That's what filled with like right wingers who have lots of money from, you know, big institutions that are pushing them um, to push a certain kind of ideology. And these, these young kids come in there and they want the approval of the professor. So they say, you know what, I'm going to learn like the basic grammar of this argument and I'm just going to use it as a ready-made argument, regardless of the historical um, contingencies, regardless of the social movements, regardless of the economic factors. I'm just going to use it over and over, regardless of how much the whole world around you is falling down and everything that you've been taught has is wrong, still, you know, continuing the same kind of uh, argument. I mean, there's something very pathological about it. Right. That's the word. I'm waiting to hear back from uh, uh, Brandon. He's, I guess, running a few minutes late. So here's what we're going to do. Because he's running a few minutes late, he doesn't get to do... <laughs> Oh, no. Let's just do one of these. Uh, we'll save him one. Which one should we save for him, and which one should we do ourselves? Oh, God. Um, let's do the one where he says he was in the civil rights movement. All right. So Joe Biden um, is – there's a great book by Brank, Branko Marchicic. Marchicic. Marchicic from Jacobin. We'll have him on. It's called Yesterday's Man – and it's a great book about Joe Biden because he actually, it's not just a polemic, it really actually fits him historically coming out of the New Deal, downward mobility in the middle class, where he situates himself politically. Um, a lot of things to be discussed about Joe Biden. Of course, mm -hmm. the bankruptcy bill, wanting to cut Social Security, Iraq, the corruption issues around his family. On the other hand, I still think, frankly, being blunt, uh, after Bernie Sanders, uh, I think he might be a better bet to put up against Trump, depressingly. Um, we can talk about that some other time. But one thing that is very clear about Joe Biden's biography, any analysis of Joe Biden, including the most sympathetic one, was that this guy who got his start incredibly early in politics, I believe he was elected to his first office when he was 27 years old. And he had a few liberal leanings on some issues. This was not a member of any movement. <laughs> this guy was not a hippie. This guy was not taking. But Joe Lieberman, one of the biggest scumbags in the history of American politics and the universe, actually was involved in the civil rights movement. Yeah. So Joe Biden, there's some goodwill. He was Obama's vice president. Here he is at Vice. Um. Again. He doesn't even know. Like his campaign is not informing him clearly because I think he's genuinely like I think he genuinely thinks the hosts don't have the right information here. Mm. Let's check this out. <laughs> Give me a break. Why is Senator Sanders leading you with black voters under the age of 35? He is not leaving black voters under the age of uh, under. And look, just all I know is I'm leading everybody combined with black voters. <laughs> I'm winning. You no, got I'm everybody. Yeah. Oh, tell, wait, 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 wait. Let's get this straight. Name me anybody who has remotely close to the support I have of the African American community. Well, actually, Vice News just did a poll that showed that Sanders is a bit behind you, but he a does bit. have significant black support. I mean, but it's he's not a something way to behind me. He's way behind. A bit and a ways is a mm -mm. Oh, yeah. Mm -mm. Come on, man. <laughs> Give me a break. Pause it. <laughs> Let's play that again. Yeah. A bit and a ways is a mm, Oh, yeah. Mm. Come on, man. <laughs> Give me a break. You, you know just, better. You come on, you, man, me? <laughs> you, you know better. You know better. There's a uh -huh. reason why I have more support of elected black officials, three former um, members of the chair of the Black Caucus, black mayors. <laughs> I mean, come on. Okay. No doubt Joe Biden has racked up endorsements. Um, and, of course, that makes total sense. Uh, he's racked up plenty of endorsements from plenty of elected elected officials, but this is the type of thing. And by the way, that vice poll is real. And that poll does show, of course, I mean, we all know from the beginning that Bernie Sanders leads with all young voters across the board from every single background. But that one did show a lead among young African-Americans. And also more recent polls are showing a general evening up across the board. But I did like, and this is the type of thing that like Trump this racist scumbag will be able to use that. I mean, because because like, oh, come on, man. Trump will say like, Joe, 
Why are you trying to impersonate Dolomite? Why are you on Vice talking like that? That's weird. Ooh, major yikes, Joe. Oh, yeah, come on, man. Hashtag cringe. Hashtag cringe, Joe. As the only lifeguard in the projects. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That would be an interesting fact check. Come on, man. I was the only lifeguard in the projects. I told Barack the first time I met him, you people can't swim, but maybe you can govern. All right. <laughs> Anyways, black people love me. All right, exclusive poll. Just as many African Americans say that consider voting for Bernie Sanders as Joe Biden. 55% of African Americans said they'd consider voting for Sanders in 2020, a statistical tie, although one point ahead. Is it 55 or 56, actually? 56. 56, two points ahead of 54% who said the same about Biden. So, Joe, sorry. Oh, yeah, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, so good. Politics has gotten just so out of whack, but it's gonna come back and whack. <laughs> uh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I think horrible record aside, because politics is also about just temperament, and entertainment, and other kinds of bullshit, that pre-senility Joe Biden would have a very good shot at Donald mm. Trump. I, I think mid diminishing capacity Joe Biden mm -hmm. might be a problem. Get your work straight, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is he mad at something I just said? Yeah. <laughs> All right, give me give me another Biden job. Uh, Let's give me give me something. Well, as the only lifeguard in the project. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best one. That is the best one. <laughs> I was the only I are the projects. Someone Go actually. Go to Joe three o three three o. Now he does. No, the thing is, there is a part that he's always taught. Like some guy uh, in Brazil actually was saying, like they, he he saw some Biden speech in Brazil that ended with like some like weird like homage to like the troops or something. It was just like, mm. what the hell are you talking about, dude? Um. Brandon Sutton is here, BJ Sutton. He has entered the building. Let's uh can we let's take a real quick break and bring the man out. And in a few minutes, David Feldman, who as some of you may know him, he's host of the David Feldman show. He's a writer for Triumph the Insult Comic Dog. He's written for many other comedians. He's a great stand-up comedian himself. He's also one of the biggest Bernie bros on the planet. So I'm, it's going to be cathartic to listen to what he has to say about this New York Times garbage. All right, let's take a really quick break, and we'll be right back with the host of the discourse. Ah, oh, man, <laughs> did you hear? Did you hear that Biden drop? I guess you, you know he was just getting listened to this Biden drop. I'm, I, we got to play the clip again. Oh uh, yeah, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, being surrounded. That is in response to a new Vice News poll showing that uh, Sanders has evened up with him with black voters, and he just refuses to believe it. And I, so he tell. well, you know what, I'm sorry. Indulge us. Let's just play it again for Brandon. It's funny. The reason why I have more support of elected black officials, three former um, members of the... Oh, wait, sorry, that's that's the wrong clip. That's, that's a different one. Clip. That's the one we have yet just to give play. Him, just give him the... the uh, just give him the... Come on, man. Oh, the whole thing? Well, no, no, just that. On a very... Just, yeah, just that would. Why is Senator Sanders leading you with black voters under the age of 35? He is not leaving black voters under the age of... Uh, under, and look, just all I know is I'm leading everybody combined with black voters. <laughs> I'm winning. You no, got I'm everybody. Yeah, oh, t wait, 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 wait. Let's get this straight. Name me anybody who has remotely close to the support I have of the African American community now. Well, actually, Vice News just did a poll that showed that Sanders is a bit behind you, but he a does bit. have significant black support. I mean, but it's he's not a something way to behind me. <laughs> he's way behind. A bit and a ways is a little. Oh, yeah. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 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 you know,
<laughs> you, you know better. You know better. Uh, There's come a on, reason man. why I'm more supportive of elected black officials. All right, Three. All right, all right, all right. Being surrounded with all those black and brown people is giving a Biden a PTSD flashback to that segregated pool. Yes. <laughs> it comes up later. His eyes going all wide, and you know, I don't know who that dude is, but he, like, corn popping in Biden's eyes. <laughs> <laughs> It comes up later. Uh, Brandon Sutton, he's host of The Discourse. Everybody become a patron immediately. It's one of the best podcasts in the game. You're also going to be with us February 7th. Get your tickets at the Bell House. How excited are you for the show, man? I'm very excited. I, I you know, I, obviously it's your show, so I won't be the center of attention, but I'm excited to be there nonetheless. You will be a center of attention. That's only because of my, like, mass. You know? No, I'm a, I'm a <laughs> conduit. I'm a conduit, man. I'm, the, the center of attention goes out to all the great guests like you. Oh, that's great. That's a great way of looking at it. Absolutely. <laughs> Figured you'd enjoy it as a narcissist. Um, Brandon, we talked about this. Um, do you think, first of all, do you think, obviously, there's still the, you know, literally whitewashed and sanitized MLK of cable news and everything. But do you think that we're making headway, at least for some, you know, groups of the population to actually be reminded and understand, like, no, this was actually a serious political radical. When it comes to Martin Luther King Jr.? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that when you look at the uh, younger black younger black and brown people who are, you know, turning out to vote, turning out to become involved in politics at the local and at the national level, you're seeing uh, reckoning with not only their own material conditions, like their own poverty, their own interactions with race, their own interactions with uh, the state and violence of the state, but also, um, I'd say, like, a reflection on the the discrepancy between the history of black figures and like what their I mean rather the whitewashed view of white of black radicals MLK Martin Luther King Jr. and the lesser known ones too and uh, the sanitized version right the version that we are presented in high school in middle school in college sometimes and especially online on the one day of year where you have to be nice to black people uh, well. <laughs> Well, MLK Junior Day and also like the NBA Finals, you have to be nice to yeah, black, right. nice nice to black say, people. Yeah, 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 definitely, right. And so, I mean, I think that people and, have become... And in both cases, they go, you know, it was a great effort. Yeah, you know. <laughs> you know, you win some, you lose some. You win some, you lose some. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, and that, that's, that's, so fucked up. that is uh, heartening. You know, you, you love seeing people, you know, reckon with their own genealogy of, you know, black thought. Uh, obviously the concept, not the canon of, of academia and the concept, not like the rapper from fucking the roots. But, you know, at the same time, you want people to not, especially black people, to not be held to the imaginary standards or just the real standards of Martin Luther King Jr., right? We know where he was in the 60s. We know where he was in the 50s. We're, we know where he was when he died. But we've had an intervening 50 years to develop ideas to, like, look back on that past and say, okay, well, here's what I think he had wrong. Here's what I think he had right. Here's what we can learn. Here's how we can synthesize the new reality. And here's what we have to leave in the past. And so I think for a lot of people, when it comes to MLK Day, people will try to transpose Martha King Jr.'s in 1960s onto the present day and say, here's what he would be doing now. Mm -hmm. And, like, you know, like, you don't have to do that because we know what he was doing then. You know, you can't say, I mean, you can say, here's who he would be most likely to find himself politically aligned or, in terms of candidates. But we don't know where he would be. But here's what we can say. We can say, well, he's I think Pete Buttigieg offers a temperament <laughs> and moderation. Joe Biden, come on, man. I, I endorse Joe. I would pay money to hear Joe Biden recount the history of Martin Luther King Jr. Like, like, it, <laughs> like I, I would pay. There are two things I would like pay money to hear Joe Biden do, and I guess both are kind of topical given the time right. of year. But like, explain the seven days of Kwanzaa and Martin Luther King Jr. I want to, I want to, I, I want my vehicle into that to be Joe Biden's uh, rambling explanation. Uh, I think it's time for that drop, Matt. Oh, yeah. Come on, man. <laughs> That's Joe Biden's response to your proposition. It's a trick, it's a trick question. <laughs> oh, come on, man. Quaz is a trick question. It is. It is. You know. <laughs> um, did you ever actually read uh, Bruce Dixon's writing on the guy who created Kwanzaa? I have not, but I will say this. I, I'm pretty sure if you were to ask Joe Biden, he would just say it's like what Lenny Kravitz celebrates. <laughs> <laughs> If you can remember who Lenny Kravitz is. So, you know, so to making um, MLK like actually. But that's interesting because if you actually make him like an actual political leader and intellectual, which he was, 
And I would argue also clearly some type of spiritual theological figure, but that makes him actually alive. And then you can contend with him, which is treating him properly, like not some type of you know weird museum piece or proxy for other people's contemporary politics. Exactly, you can use him. As, yeah. You can you know treat him like a real person, somebody who was in conversation with his own politics and in conversation with the politics of the time, and someone who showed like self doubt. We know at the time when he yeah. was be the time when he was assassinated, he was in many ways grappling with the idea of nonviolence. For one example, like grappling with the viability of nonviolence when it comes to organizing, you know, for liberation, black liberation, and he was also organizing on along class lines too, like. You know, I think that people point out rightfully that a large part of Martha King Jr.'s, like the canon of his life, the, the the trajectory of his life, was melding an analysis of class and race together, explaining how those two interweave and how liberation of black people is in many ways rooted in the liberation of them as a, like an economic class. And that kind of gets whitewashed away when we go into the future and goes, OK, well, you know, it was, the March on Washington was a march for racial equality in some sort of vague, overarching way. But what does that actually mean? Like, what does racial equality mean? in the context of the march on Washington? What does it mean in the context of Martha King Jr.'s life? What does it mean in the context of the 60s and, you know, in the civil rights era? And, you know, it, it, it's sad because even just to be kind of rude, I think, you know, you look at a lot of people who are celebrating Martha King Jr., not just the Republicans, right? Not just the people who are obviously would not have been supporting him. But you look at some of the more Democrat-leaning people, the liberals, and you say, hey, uh, we know that part of your own personal mythology, part of the personal mythology of you and the candidates you support is that like, if you were to be in the 1960s, you would have been on the front lines of the, central, the civil rights era. But we know that's not true. Yeah, we know. It's like, we, we know like, right. based on how they react to modern uh, liberation, how they react to Black Lives Matter, how they react to Palestine, how they react to any kind of movement by people who are oppressed in order to like sort of somehow like grapple or you know take back power from the state or from you know in case of the global south take back power from america take back self agency right um no and and again of course like by the end too i mean look when we all know that when he made a class turn um and probably most importantly spoke out against uh the you know atrocities the mass murder campaign in vietnam he was loathed by the you know the establishment, and of course we'll do this in the post game. But obviously another culmination of this is, you know, the FBI sending him out a tweet, you know, from you know as they from presumably from the J Edgar Hoover Federal Building, the guy who literally tried to get him to commit suicide. Yeah, I mean, some intern was there, and you know, it was between it was it was <laughs> some FBI intern, you know, the Pete Buttigieg of the future right. was there, uh, trying to craft the perfect MLK Jr. memoriam tweet, and it was either that or like pick the top three emojis that make you want to kill yourself. And <laughs> <laughs> these are the top three emojis that Jagger Hoover would have sent to MLK yeah. if it was today. Exactly. So I mean, you don't know what he. Would They're be. still surveilling black liberation movements today. They're still like right. they're, they're still. I mean, I would go. I don't mind sounding conspiratorial. Like they're still assassinating black radicals today. They're like you know, in many ways, like the assassination of black radicals has never really ended. There are like, basically any one of any note who was involved in the Ferguson protest has died under mysterious circumstances. And so, I mean, you know, the legacy of MLK and I, well, I would say the unfortunate reality of MLK is along with the whitewashing. He acts sort of as a, I don't know, a waypoint in the past for people to point to and say, okay, here's what racism was. Racism was segregation, uh, you know, de jure segregation, uh, redlining, all those like, you know, things that were occurring in the past. And now we're here and things are different and racism is gone. But a lot of the things that we were still dealing with in the past have not only stuck around, but they've gotten worse, you know, and they've gotten worse because people, I think, well, A, they've gotten worse because the state has gotten more power. It has, you know, solidified, uh, you know, in some ways, uh, its media apparatus has become more solid. It's become more. It, it's become more like more digital. <laughs> you know, yep. it's, it's surveillance has become easier, uh, and so now, you know, we're dealing with the not only like the same the same police state, but like on steroids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know, we're dealing with people in some ways trying to pretend as though this like that kind of racism is in the past because that's where Martin Luther King Jr. is, and that's where we're you know we we've come so far. But you know, have we? You know, like what by what by what standard? And I think people, you know, point to MLK and then they point to Obama and they say, look how far we've come. And it's just like, have we have we? Right. It's just like, have we come that far? We're going to keep going on this theme. Um, but first, we're going to do uh, I mean, I'm assuming if you're like me, 
because I know you're also a Bernie bro, that you're pretty disgusted with the New York Times. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, you. I'm sure you probably weren't surprised, but still disgusted. It was funny. <laughs> I mean, well, I have a low level of disgust with the New York Times all like it throughout my day. But then like, you mean the endorsement? Yes. That was funny. <laughs> that was funny. That okay, was well, funny. I, I'm pissed. And that's why I wanted to get David Feldman, because David Feldman... I'm amazed. I mean, his Bernie passion and his anger, his he's livid at the New York Times. So I wanted to give him an opportunity to join us in the vent. He's, of course, host of the David Feldman Show. Everybody subscribe to it now. We're going to take a brief break, and then David Feldman is going to come back and break down the fecklessness, the absolute cowardice of the New York Times editorial board. We'll be right back on The Michael Brooks Show. Welcome back to the Michael Brooks Show. Joining us now to, well, uh, Brandon Sutton says it's funny. Um, I'm disgusted. And joining to commiserate with us on this just embarrassing. I mean, first of all, two endorsing two candidates in a sort of pathetic pseudo woke play, totally disrespecting Bernie Sanders, is uh, to, to help with the catharsis here is David Feldman. He's host of the David Feldman Show, stand up comedian writer for any number of people from triumph the insult comic dog to dennis miller back in a time when dennis miller was funny they tell me uh and he's also a huge bernie bro major supporter big, of the movement david feldman big, thanks for being here big big bernie bro big from way back before you were born before, I'm, you know, I'm a socialist from way back i i uh david brooks and i belong to the same socialist book <laughs> Club of the book, book of the month club uh, before you were born. Oh, okay. David, big socialist. Yeah. What were you guys I, reading? I, oh, the uh, Marx, Engels. Uh, I was a red diaper baby. Uh, <laughs> my parents weren't. My parents weren't uh, communists. I was born with irritable bowel syndrome, oh. and uh, oh. that's why I was a red diaper. But listen, I'm pissed off. <laughs> so I don't want to make any jokes here. I'm pissed off. I'm a big Bernie bro. I want to get there just like everybody else. And I'm pissed off at the New York Times. Pissed. Well, so am I, dude. I, 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 I called my sister. I said, change your password. I'm no longer using it to log into the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel That's exactly the same way, way, David. I'm sorry? I feel exactly the same way. I'm disgusted and embarrassed. I was frankly. pissed off. I, I was pissed off, and I got angry because you know I'm a big Bernie bro, yep. big, big Bernie bro. And uh, I was going to write a letter to the editor, but then I thought, what would Martin Luther King, what would Doctor Martin Luther King do? 
<laughs> well, I'm sure we were just explaining why saying this sort of thing is maybe not the best approach, but... No, I'm interested. <laughs> okay, okay, all right, yeah, all right. Well, Brandon's interested, by the way. Uh, Brandon uh, Sutton is here with us, in case you didn't I, know. Yeah, I, I see Brandon, and, and, and I think Dr. Martin Luther King would say, let the gray lady talk. Let's hear what the New York Times has to say. <laughs> there's room. There's room for every opinion. Let's take it all. Let's take it all in. And uh, I think Dr. Martin Luther King would ask me to reevaluate Bernie, to ask myself, you know, has he alienated women? And as a woke male, uh, I, f I think... Uh, I think nobody likes Bernie. I, I think I'm. I think he doesn't have any friends in the Senate. I think Hillary. I think he owes Hillary Clinton an apology uh, for saying during the debates, "Enough with the damn emails." I think when he when he in, at the convention when he put her name, he nominated her by acclaim, acclamation. When he was out on the campaign trail pushing for Hillary, I thought that was patronizing to women, and he owes an apology. Wait, wait a like second. He, wait a second, Dave. Okay, all right. You know what, David? I'm going to get this. This is like Lucy and the football here. Every time you come on, I think we're on the same page, and then you start on these different roads. So you're actually saying, with a straight face, presumably, that Bernie Sanders, who ran a totally easy campaign against Hillary Clinton, took issues off of the table instead of attacking her like any normal candidate would do, then nominated her at the convention, then did, I believe, over 30 appearances for her, including in places like Michigan, where she refused to campaign through a combination of arrogance and incompetence. You're saying that this was all a giant act of him being patronizing? Condescending, supercilious. It's like holding the door open for the woman... <laughs> saying, you can't do it without me, Bernie Sanders. It was degrading, frankly. And I like Bernie, and I want all the things he wants. But as a man, we have to ask ourselves, you know, I have a daughter. Do I want her being propped up by an old white man like Bernie Sanders? I think it was offensive, and I think that's why Hillary lost. So in I other words, he, because Bernie Sanders supported her and campaigned across the country for her and worked as hard out for her. That's why she lost. It was solicitous. It was unnecessary. It was, he was saying a woman can't win without me. And I think a lot of people in the blue wall in the Rust Belt said, hey, she's weak. Bernie, Bernie's right. She's weak. She needs a guy. So, yeah, I, I think, hey, look, I want everything Bernie wants. I'm a Bernie bro. But I have to ask myself, what would Martin Luther King do? And he would say, check your gut. And I, I check my gut. And I, I'm thinking maybe there's a little misogyny. On Bernie's part, you know, Elizabeth Warren, for example. You know, I, I want to talk about the, the, the endorsement. But, you know, I'm for revolution, not evolution. You know that about me, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Revolution. Not evolution. I am uh, Bernie all the way. Uh, but I have to say, if Bernie told Elizabeth Warren in a private conversation that a woman could can't get elected president, then I got to reconsider. I, I, if Bernie's a misogynist, uh, then I want evolution, not revolution. Wow. So basically, yeah. you're saying that based off of a, a report, a leak by somebody either in the Warren campaign or somebody uh, close to Warren or maybe some journalists that Warren uh, presented her side of the conversation about. And even though we have video of Bernie Sanders going back to the 1980s, encouraging women to run for office, saying that there could be a woman president, that you yeah. believe Warren's version of this story for no apparent reason. And also that because of a private comment that there's a dispute about, you don't believe in things like Medicare for all anymore. I believe in everything Bernie believes. I do. But if he said a woman can't get elected, then I'm not so sure health care is a human right. 
I'm not. not I, friends, I, I, can you help me here? I don't think there's anything wrong with a little bit of a light negging between friends. You know. <laughs> you know. No, I, I. I'm just saying. I want everything Bernie wants, but if it turns out in a private conversation, he expressed doubt that a woman can't be Donald Trump, then I think we have to go much slower on reducing the price of prescription drugs. <laughs> and that's my taking a, a good long look in the mirror as a, as a woke male and keeping it real, which is, you know, that's what Dr. King would have said. Dr. King would tell me to do that. I think the problem with your show, and I'm a big fan of yours. Yep. I'm a big, I'm a Bernie bro, but I think we have to lay off these purity tests. Right. Like Lula, for example, you like Lula, you interviewed Lula. Yes. Big right? fan of Lula. He's my, he's my hero. He's your hero. Even though he has a prison record. <laughs> Up until well, he was a political ago, prisoner, was, uh, David. He was, I, I don't care. See, that's the difference. I don't need to know why he went behind bars. He, he, he paid his price. He paid his debt to society. He's out. This is you with the purity tests. Well, he was he committed. To, I don't know. Well, he was released because the the intercept actually Glenn Greenwald's now getting politically persecuted by the Brazilian regime. They actually showed that the prosecution of him was corrupt from the outset. They demonstrated so the Supreme Court was was shamed into letting him out temporarily. But whatever. Uh, the point I'm making is a great guy. That's the point. I don't have purity tests. <laughs> Dr. Martin Luther King. Right. You've seen the mug shots. He was arrested countless times. <laughs> but I measure the entirety of the man. Right. No purity test. Dr. Nelson Man Mandela. Doc. He did time. <laughs> Dr. Malcolm X. He did time. Dr. Mahatma Gandhi. <laughs> Dr. Eugene Debs. Some of my favorite rap artists like Dr. Dr. Dre. They all did time. But I don't hold them up to purity tests like Michael Brooks does. Everybody has to be pure. <laughs> well, I've actually been saying for a long time, I don't think so. I think you just need to have a solid political agenda. But um, uh, so wait, are you saying I just want to understand I'm where you're coming Bernie. from? I'm a Bernie bro. I, OK, I, I'm a socialist <laughs> from wait from before you were from born before we were born. OK, so let's get back to that in a second. So you, in 1964. We all know that my, LBJ said any number of horrible things. Barely. Right. Probably he did say it in front of the press. They just didn't report it then. He said racist stuff. He said anti-Semitic stuff. He said sexist stuff. All sorts of stuff. So if you heard him say those things, would you then be neutral between him and Goldwater or say that he shouldn't sign the Voting Rights Act or the Civil Rights Act? I mean, I'm just taking. I, I'm just doing your logic here, David. I, I resent your challenging my liberal bona fides. <laughs> my grandfather marched in Selma with uh, Bull Connor. He, he worked for Bull Connor, <laughs> and for you to challenge my my bona fides is uh, is offensive to me. Wait a second. You think it's a liberal bona fides that your grandfather marched? Bull, Bull Connor was the terrorist sheriff who was sicking dogs and hoses and God knows what else that we don't even have historically established on civil okay. rights uh, marchers. So now your now, we're, blaming, was with now we're blaming, now we're blaming dogs for racial intolerance. Uh, can we, let's move on. Okay. Let's just, <laughs> <laughs> all right, David, you know what, David, I'm getting fed up. Okay. What they, the New York times first, they totally, uh, you know, they didn't give Bernie a fair shake at all, which we knew was going to happen. And then they did something that was just utterly embarrassing, which if you were a Warren supporter, which I'm beginning to suspect you are, you have all of the markings. No, 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 no. Bernie, really? Bernie, 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 Bernie. So you're going to vote for Bernie. I would have and I would have voted for Bernie uh, in 2016. I would have voted for him. You would have. Well, you could have voted for Bernie. What happened? I know, but I voted, I voted for Hillary. But I would have voted for Bernie if I could, but I couldn't. I voted for Hillary. Oh, well, why couldn't you have voted for him? I just couldn't. <laughs> but I wanted to. <laughs> okay. Because I'm a lefty from, from way, way back. back. 
Do you have you anything know, to I, add I, here? I, I have, All I can say is you know what doctor I, hasn't been behind bars? Dr. Henry Kissinger. I'm sorry? Ooh, I'm sorry? Ooh, d uh, David, uh, listen to Brandon. I was going to say, you know what doctor hasn't been behind bars? Uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger. Maybe we should, you know, uh, take a little lesson from him. You know, you can get your doctor without, you know, serving time. Which most people yeah, don't know. Doctor, Dr. Henry Kissinger. Dr. Yeah. Henry Kissinger. Reverend Dr. I Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Reverend Dr. The Reverend, the, the the Reverend, Reverend Dr. Dr. Sister Henry Hillary Clinton. <laughs> the Reverend Dr. Sister yeah. Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So you hate Henry the, Kissinger, though, because you're a lefty. I me. hate Henry Kissinger, yes. And I think there's something appealing about the New York Times endorsing uh, two people. I think that's good. But It's all about choice. It's a good look. It's a good look. <laughs> you know? Not, Big Ten thinking. Wait, Brandon has another question for you. Not to play devil's advocate, yes, but what do you do in a situation where you're in a primary and you've been told that you can vote for either... Warren or Klobuchar, and it's just fine. You know, either one is fine. Like how? Like how do you? That's, how do you? You know, how is that that information actionable? If you're if you're in Iowa, who do you vote for? Well, that's a good question because uh, you know we have someone like Amy Klobuchar who says we shouldn't dream big. That's good. And then there's Elizabeth Warren who says there's nothing wrong with dreaming big, so long as those big dreams never come to fruition. <laughs> that's also good. <laughs> So it, that, I like that choice going in and then calling an audible. You know, I, I like that freedom at the last minute to choose between Amy Klobuchar and Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> wait a second. You're, wait, 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 wait. You just distilled this that Amy Klobuchar says we shouldn't dream big. And Elizabeth Warren says there's nothing wrong with dreaming big just as long as those dreams yeah. don't come into fruition. Yeah. Well, obviously, you know, again, I'm a Bernie bro right. from way back, from way back. But you didn't, the two of you obviously never read, you didn't read the New York Times endorsement because it's really a choice between charisma and storytelling. If you read the, <laughs> the, the editorial, they praised Elizabeth Warren for her storytelling ability, uh -huh. uh, but they didn't specify which story. <laughs> was it the one about her Native American heritage? Was it the one about never taking money from a super PAC? Or was it the one about how she's going to fight for Medicare for all? They didn't specify which story. So I found that lacking. Whereas uh, they also said, you know, if you're in the mood for charisma, Amy Klobuchar. <laughs> I have to agree. So I'm leaning towards Amy Klobuchar because I think the New York Times made a better case <laughs> For they Amy Klobuchar's say, charisma did they actually than they did for Elizabeth charisma? Warren's. Yeah, she had Midwest charisma. Oh, my God. Like when she eats an egg salad sandwich with her comb instead of a fork. <laughs> Although, when you think about it, that's not really charisma. That's just her being an enchantress. I find that. And they praised her style of leadership, Michael. You know, Bernie talks about this revolution, but Amy's Amy's all about leadership, leading from behind. Like when she berates her staff and throws coffee cups at them, <laughs> says they're dim-witted community college dropouts. That's how you spark the loyalty necessary to mobilize a mass movement of Americans <laughs> desperately thirsting for moderation. Well, I mean, yeah. Oh, wait. So, okay. The New York Times writes in their endorsement, reports of how Senator Klobuchar treats her staff give us pause. They raise serious questions about her ability to attract and hire talented people. The problem is her staff is stupid. Uh, they, I, love, I love they just double neg the staff. Absolutely abusing your staff we're not that concerned about. But if you abuse them too much, you're only going to be able to get dunskies. <laughs> Right. Is that how can you... I, can I just say something? Can yeah. I just say something about your attitude, Mr. Yes. Sutton's attitude? Yes. Your snarky attitude? Yes. She throws coffee cups at her staff, right? She berates her staff. Yes. But if a man did that, you know what people would say? They'd say, can you imagine if a woman did that? <laughs> <laughs> So let's, let's back off with the double standards. Once removed. I'm, what I'm saying here 
is uh, second wave double standards by <laughs> Mr. Sutton. And this, this is this new double standard once removed. Okay? So ask yourself, yes, Amy Klobuchar throws rocks <laughs> I... and at her staff, but suppose a woman did that. Ask yourself that. What would you say? I guess it's okay then. I'm actually not too down on Amy Klobuchar. I can't spell her name, but I will say that I find her dedication to vibrating at a for, at, at a pleasing frequency quite, you know, it's, I don't know who told her. what. You know, she has a, excuse me for one second, okay, Donald Trump. She has a condition, okay? She's scared shitless. <laughs> is, it, is that really it? Because and, and that's, she, like, she vibrates you're at making a fun. You are. You are making fun of people who are scared shitless. <laughs> I happen to have a son who's scared shitless, and I don't have a sense. I don't have a sense of humor about people who were born scared shitless. <laughs> you, you know, you smug lefties. You just, you. I'm sorry, I, and I'm a Bernie bro. You know that. Well, I'm increasingly not knowing that, David. She's Amy Klobuchar. I mean, there's, it's hard to find much sunlight between her and Bernie in many ways. <laughs> well, I want to go back to Warren for a second because it, it really, yeah. you do, and, and no offense, David, but I just think as, as, a, as we listen to you talk, yeah. not wanting to actually achieve anything, um, but wanting the sort of brand of wanting to have big change, you do sound like a Warren person. I am. <laughs> well, no, I mean, you know, she's my first choice. Wait a second. What, no wait, second wait, wait, wait. Oh, I thought Bernie was your first choice. <laughs> well, I'm, no, no. My, my Bernie is my, uh, if I have no second choice, then I'm voting for Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> That's, you know, her father was a janitor? Yes, I did know that. And what's great about Elizabeth Warren is that's all we know. About her father, that he was a janitor. <laughs> Do you like that she calls him daddy uh, at times? Do you think that that's the kind of folksy thing that will uh, flip a Trump voter to her? Well, I, I'd suggest that she also call him Meemaw. <laughs> she should call him Meemaw, too. <laughs> Now, I know, but, you know, David, David, I know that for a long time, and including people like me who've been critical of Warren, we both because Donald Trump obviously attacked her in a racist way and because I'm I'm actually not into purity politics, but also because, uh, you know, people are very uh, policing and very controlling around the parameters mm -hmm. of what you can critique about Warren. But. People like me didn't mention anything about her saying she was a Native American for decades or her uh, recipe that she did, put in a recipe book that she said was a family recipe, but all of that. And I've always said... Pow wow chow. Pow wow chow. And I've always said, hey, you know what? Even if you don't want to... And plenty of Native American people still find this to be deeply offensive, but even if you don't want to go to the merits of the case... As much as, you know, you you can be uptight and whatever in a Democratic primary, obviously Donald Trump's going to dine out on it. And it might be a real vulnerability for her, for a broad set of voters who find it, you know, phony and dishonest and weird. Uh, and, you know, I've heard you talking. I haven't heard any doctors. I haven't heard about Dr. Leonard Peltier as an example. But uh, you surely should be concerned, concerned about... This, her uh, authenticity? Her, well, authentic and also how offensive it is to so many members of the Native American community. No? Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> That's her identity, my friend. She's being authentic, <laughs> lying about her ethnic heritage and pretending that she can let her hair down and have a beer with you. That's her identity. That's authentic. That's an authentic Harvard technocrat. And she has every right to exercise her culture without you passing judgment on being a Harvard technocrat. So, I find you intolerant. So I've, I've also heard that because it was, it was demonstrated by the Boston Globe that, uh, she did not get her job because she claimed she was Native American, but she did let Harvard list 
that they had a Native American on faculty. She did the powwow chow. Uh, you don't think this is a problem? She's always offering to have a beer, you know, have a beer with Elizabeth Warren. She, she has a drinking problem, obviously. <laughs> that suggests some, <laughs> perhaps, the Native Americans have a... The problem with the drinking, so obviously there's something there. And you know the thing that you don't understand as a as a white male, right? Well, wait, Brandon is not a white male. Excuse you. Yeah, but he could pass for a white male. He, he, he's got a he's got that white male attitude. You're not a woman, Brandon. You're not a woman. And, you know, not only am I a Bernie bro from way back, <laughs> but I believe in women. And right. I, I have treated women with respect before they even deserved any. <laughs> that's how old. That's how far. And, I, you know, I don't know what it's like over at the, you're at the Michael Brooks show, but uh, I found out that women get paid 70 cents on the dollar. When I found that out, I immediately began paying all the women on my show 80 cents on the dollar <laughs> across the board. No questions asked. This is what an ally looks like. It sounds like. I, I, I want you to take, no, want you to take exactly, note, Michael. Brandon, thank I know. I've got a lot Brandon, to learn. thank you. We all have a lot to learn, to be frank. <laughs> you, know, it's, you know, it's... <laughs> so, Did you know that Amy Klobuchar... This is what I like about Amy Klobuchar. Yes. Um... And again, I, you know, I'm a Bernie bro, but I have to say, uh, you may not know this about Amy Klobuchar, but her father was an alcoholic <laughs> who was married three times and ended up completely broke on Medicaid. And, you know, she doesn't like to talk about that unless it's on national television in front of millions of people because she respects her father's privacy. And that's what I'm looking for uh, for my daughter. I, I like to think. When she, when my daughter runs for president, she'll respect my privacy the way Amy Klobuchar respects her father's privacy. Because in the end, the one thing I want the world to know about me is that I was an alcoholic, divorced three times, and ended up flat broke. That's uh, you know what, David? I can barely take any more of this. Uh, th don't you think that... If you and clearly you're some type of Warren Klobuchar, whatever, when, shouldn't both of these candidates be pissed? Because it it would have. I, I mean, I don't think a New York Times endorsement is such a big deal outside of a certain very very narrow segment of the population, which Elizabeth Warren was probably doing pretty well in anyways, along with Mayor Pete. But at the same mm -hmm. time, a good clean endorsement would have been good for her. And obvious and Klobuchar, she's. I mean, the media keep trying to make her happen, but she's never happening. That would have been a real thing if she had a straight up endorsement. Aren't they sort of in this really try hard way, actually hurting both of these candidates by making this ridiculous dual endorsement? Michael, 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 Michael. I didn't want to do this, but I'm going to use a very sophisticated term and it's going to be intimidating. Yes. So. Get ready to bend to my hyper-educated, technocratic will. Mm -hmm. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm going to explain the New York Times endorsing two people. And uh, I'm going to use a term you've never heard before, which means you and Brandon are going to discover that I'm smarter than the both of you because I'm using a term you've never heard before. So you'll trust my judgment because I know this term and I speak seven different languages. Oh my God, what is the term? Jesus Christ. Uh, I, well, I'm just, I just want to set this up so you know I'm better than you. I'm, <laughs> I'm better, but I'm going to help you. Okay? Because I'm hyper-educated. Right. But I'm looking out for you. I'm looking out for you in a paternalistic way. Are you ready? <laughs> yes, I'm ready. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, be prepared to hear how much smarter <laughs> I am than you. And this will explain... The New York Times editorial. Yes. Are you prepared? I'm prepared. Okay. Here's the term. Get ready to feel inferior and <laughs> ask me for guidance. Okay. okay. Here's the term. Cognitive dissonance. <laughs> see how smart I am? You see how smart? I just used a term. 
Okay. <laughs> Look. So I listen. I'm not lording it over you. Okay. Hey. I happen to know the meaning of cognitive dissonance. Well, I, dissonance, I, I, and you don't. I might, and, and I, I don't see how this is helping your case. No, I'm just trying to show you that you should kind of, with all due respect, keep your mouth shut and let a, a technocrat like me decide what you really need without having to listen to you. Okay? In other words, I'm better educated. I have more diplomas. I'm not better than you. I'm just entitled to a much bigger slice of the pie than you are. Okay? <laughs> okay. Okay. What about Brandon? Uh, Are you entitled? He, Brandon, Brandon happens to have, I believe, a PhD. Brandon, Brandon. No, I do not. Brandon. Okay, just short of a PhD. Just short of a lot of things. Just short of a PhD. <laughs> well, he does, he has That's a... fantastic. But, but I'm a, I, I, listen, I want you to have a good life. So long <laughs> as it doesn't cost me anything. And your child doesn't take up a, a space at an exclusive private school reserved for my kid. Because <laughs> you know, if you get in the way of my child... I will cut you. But other than that, we all want the same things. Uh, David, wasn't okay. that enough? Do you think that Elizabeth Warren telling a, 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 an activist that her kids were public school educated, even though they mostly went to private school, that that might be another thing that could be a problem against Trump? Well, that's cognitive dissonance, being able to keep two opposing ideas in your head, the facts and the truth. And that's what you learn going, you know, when you live at Harvard, you learn to keep two separate ideas in your head. That is, that comes with intellectual rigor. <laughs> I'm for Medicare for all. I'm not for Medicare for all. That's the, that's what an intellectual does. She has the ability to see both sides of an issue. Right. On one hand, healthcare is a moral issue. On the other hand, I have health care, so who gives a shit? <laughs> <laughs> but my question is, like, less, I don't care about this in relation to Bernie because I don't think it is that meaningful. For It would have been funny if they endorsed Bernie. It would have shown that they had some self-reflection. But isn't just just offensive to Warren and Klobuchar? Son. Well, that's what I was trying to I'm say. Sorry? Like, is it not just well, offensive? Is it not just offensive to Warren and Klobuchar? I mean, I'm not a big fan of Warren or Klobuchar, but I can acknowledge that their politics and their policy prescriptions are like different. You know, they have different they have different prescriptions for society to a certain. You know, well, yeah, I mean, Klobuchar yeah. tells us not to dream. Yeah, and Klo Elizabeth Warren says we can dream just as long as those dreams don't come. Yeah, Klobuchar wish. is the black pill. Fuck it, candidate. You know what? <laughs> whatever. Like let's let's just go like buck wild. And you know, Warren has ideas. Of you know various okay. degrees, uh, but you know isn't endorsing both of them just basically treating them as though they're interchangeable? Like okay, well you know what, it, you know either Amy or Warren is fine. I, I mean I imagine that there is just some like theoretical person who is like well maybe five or six people all across America who were leaning towards Warren or Klobuchar. Now they're just left you know in a, without any kind of guidance. You know shouldn't we think okay. about like that you know person? Okay, let me let me let me explain something to you, Mister Mister Sutton. You're you're short of a PhD, right? Uh, uh, Is that correct? Yeah. You know. Okay. As a as a technocrat, uh, I find your use of the words policy prescriptions to be somewhat anodyne and childish, if, if, if I may be so bold, because you will discover when you finally do get your PhD, you will soon discover that the American people are too stupid to understand policy prescriptions, okay? Because they don't have your PhD. Well, I so you, so you, will, you will have to infantilize the American people, because how else do you justify all that work going towards your PhD. Do you understand what I'm saying? That if you have a PhD, it then follows that everyone else is stupid. So you can't discuss policy prescriptions with the American people. You have to, you have to tell them a story, okay? This I, is something you will learn when you get your PhD and you will begin to tell a story to the American people, okay? No, I mean, I agree with you a little bit. Not that people are too stupid to understand policy prescriptions, but that the idea that people don't care about policy has kind of been an underlying current to the Democratic Party's, uh, you know, like their brand for a while, for lack of a better word. But doesn't that just hurt, you know, Warren? Like who, like for, again, better or worse, whether I like her policies or not, she's a very policy heavy candidate. That's like her, you know, main claim to fame. 
Doesn't that well, not of... really, not, <laughs> not really, because if you're part of the consultant class like I am, you have to push the idea that the American people are stupid and you have to manipulate them with story that they can't grasp policy because I'm educated. And if I'm educated, that means other people have to be stupid, which means they can't understand the policy that I study to get my master's and eventually my Ph.D. I... This is something... Oh, I'm I don't the, think you understand how this works. I don't understand how anything <laughs> works. But I'm of the opinion, honestly, if you had gotten any 12 people off the street, like just randomly and put them in a room to interview all like the candidates, they would have asked better, more poignant questions than the New York Times editorial board. Like, had you just, you know, gone out. But, but, but they don't have PhDs. I mean, they that, don't have diplomas. That's how can a, you trust somebody without a diploma? <laughs> I mean, that's that's actually uh, the problem, I think. You know, when you spend all your time in yeah. academia or any of these, like, specialized, uh, you know, thought industries, I, for lack of a better term, you end up... Are you proposing... Wait a second. Hang on for one second. Are you proposing <laughs> some Hobbesian nightmare where somebody with a degree from Oklahoma State University <laughs> could know as much as somebody who graduated from Yale? I mean, that's chaos. I, that's anarchy. I've spent a lot of time over the past week watching Gilmore Girls, so my faith in Yale has been <laughs> dramatically reduced. But I will say, no, I think that the problem we actually have with our technocracy is that they're not really experts in the classical sense. They don't have any like real claim to expertise so much as they are like upper middle class yuppies who are allowed to pretend like they're experts because they're upper middle class yuppies. Like, you know, I think a large part of Warren's like plans have unnecessary, you know, essentially unnecessary positions baked in for the technocratic class when they're unnecessary. Oh, I said unnecessary twice, but when they're, when it shouldn't be a jobs program. Hang on, for, hang on, hang on for one right. second. Certainly you're not suggesting that working in a war administration should be anything more than a resume builder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, we we have this revolving door between instant like public and private institutions that like it, it it's hard to it's hard to deny that it feels like a lot of these you know plans that call for you know we have we have to have this committee to to enter to in uh to investigate AI and facial recognition and the racial bias behind that we have to have this you know this committee for this this new agency you know to handle the bureaucracy of finding out like or rather for handling the transition to medicare for all it feels like a lot of these things are just well i have all these stakeholders in my campaign i have all of these people who i who i know would be a great in this position but maybe the position doesn't need to exist in that function maybe we just maybe we need to not necessarily get away get away from the idea of technocracy like you know putting the right people in the right jobs but get away from the idea that that's what we have right now like, I, I, I mean, okay, I, I hear you. I hear you. David, I hear you. Okay. make your final let me, let me case say, here because we got to go okay. to get to the post game. So, first of all, okay, here's I'm, my I'm very here's angry my at you. You came again on my show under false pretenses. And uh, but nonetheless, you are here. So as Bill O'Reilly would say, you have the final word. OK, Mr. Sutton, it was, I, I, I encourage this I, uh, like a spirited debate. As long as I, don't. I ignore your points and uh, <laughs> I shout louder than you do, okay? I, so I agreed with you know, I, and I enjoy spirited debate. But <laughs> let me just say something about Amy Klobuchar and Elizabeth Warren. They have a story, okay? And that's what the New York Times understands is they have a story. <laughs> Bernie, who I love, I love <laughs> Bernie, but he doesn't have a story, you know. Uh, He's never once, you know, held a competition to have a beer with him. <laughs> uh, I have no idea if Bernie Sanders was ever assaulted by his gynecologist. Ooh. Maybe he was. Maybe he wasn't. Yikes. But it would be nice to know if he opened up about his personal life. I, I'm pretty sure he. You know, Joe Biden. Joe Biden had a child who died. OK, so for him, death is personal. Has anyone ever died in Bernie's life? Maybe. Maybe. I'd like to know if Bernie ever had someone he loved die. That's something we should know about a president. He needs to open up more. Otherwise, quite frankly, I'm for evolution and not revolution. Because well, David Feldman, I hate you. <laughs> you okay. are. I... I, I 
I may disagree <laughs> with your opinion, but I will fight to the death of me to make a fortune going on cable television news spouting nonsense. <laughs> David Feldman, host of the David Feldman Show. Thank you so much. That was great. <laughs> That's it. Are we still on? Yeah, we're still on. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Yes. I hate myself. I, I see this inside of me. Like I, 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 I know that there's a part of me that, deep down, that I could have been that guy. You know, and it's just like I want to. I, I want to join Opus Day and just start beating myself. You know, it's it's perfect because we sit and we consume this character, like whether it's the Democratic Party leadership or the New York Times or MSNBC or see like this thing that you're embodying. We have to deal with constantly in every way. It was like a, a couple of weeks ago. Do you, you know who Joe Lockhart is? Yeah, the lobbyist for the health insurance company. Yeah, this guy, he co-founded, Glover, he co-founded Glover Park Group after he was, I think he was Bill Clinton's press secretary. And he co-founded a firm yeah, called Glover president. Park Group, which has worked for everything from the health insurance industry to the Saudi royal family to Verizon to, uh, they were big, they were also a big part of the uh, Pete Peterson's cut the deficit austerity thing. And now right. he's on CNN. And what I also love is that he hosts a podcast called Words Matter which is just, incre <laughs> it's like, you know, this whole like fake news, people don't trust things world might have something to do with the industry that you were a pioneer of, my friend. And he, and he put a tweet out where he said, you know, uh, Bernie just, you know, he hasn't been scrutinized yet. And he's also, he's really good because he, he really, he reminds everybody that he's, you know, he's a balls and strikes CNN analyst. And he's had plenty of good things to say about Bernie. And I, I quote right. tweeted it and I, you know, I said something to the effect of like, obviously it's ridiculous. And also maybe the co-founder of Glover Park Group will not be so thrilled about, you know, Bernie's electoral agenda and his response, which was something to the effect of like, you know, some type of middling response about Bernie, uh, you know, not getting scrutinized, whatever. And then this, and then the only other part about Glover Park Group was just, he was just, as for my record, feel free to criticize. <laughs> yeah, that is just perfect. Like, I just said you work for Verizon and the fucking Saudis. And they're like, well, feel free. <laughs> there is this really weird myth that's been going around for like at least five years as they've been criticizing Brandon. He's yet to be vetted. And it's hard to interpret that as anything other than like them expecting for this weird, like, bombshell like oh he used prison labor at his arkansas mansion to just come out and blow <laughs> because like i think that we, people have been conditioned by like their terrible candidates that they support to have like these huge like otherwise disqualifying things come out but being sort of you know shackled to the democratic party or republican party mm -hmm. and having to ignore them so like they're expecting that for bernie and like it's just not going to happen it's not, and then the things they think it are it's going to be it's like the people who see him in, in a Soviet sauna are either going to be like, this is horrible, he's a communist, in which case that guy's already voting for Trump, or they're going to be like us and be like, can we use this to promote our what, Bell House show? That's kind of awesome. Yeah, well, what was it? The week the week before the Warren thing dropped, it was they were criticizing him because he uh, he had a child out of wedlock and skipped Vietnam. Yeah. And everyone was like, yeah, that's awesome. It's like he fucks in, in, yeah. and fucked the army. Like, yeah, like, exactly. Right, yeah, like, when, when you, you, you weren't right. supposed to fight in Vietnam. It's just like, that's, like, that's, the, like, that's the wrong thing to do, but I think that just goes back to and what also we're like out of wedlock. Like, are you kidding? Like, is this some people should look at some stats. I, I don't know. I mean, this country Vietnam was obviously an atrocity, but I think that the liberal class specifically, like this, not even liberal, but the centrist Democrat class, they take a certain amount of pride in their ability to like criticize things, but go along with them anyway, yes. where it's like, there's this very weird dynamic where they, they are incredibly because it, like as a uh, Feldman made very clear by his own, his, you know, his bit, sorry, I don't know, but the word for it, like, like they are comfortable 
And so, like, they yeah. feel very comfortable in stepping outside of that system, and at least in their own opinion, and criticizing it, but then just swimming along with the current and not making waves. And they feel still like that ability to criticize but not change or not engage in any kind of action to change the problem that they're acknowledging outside of in the most minor, minor ways is sufficient. Like, a sufficient, it's a sufficient, right. uh, you know, right. mechanism for changing. Right. For, like, at least it's a sufficient enough to give them a level of moral superiority within our society that they feel differentiates them from the Republican party. Right. Right. Well, that you was... know what it is when you watch, when you watch the debates, uh, I noticed something, all the, the Democrats now are willing to state the problem. And they're even now willing to state the cause of the problem, but they're not willing to state the solution except Bernie. And that right. to me is, I think it's worse than Trump. I think for you know Biden and Klobuchar and you know Elizabeth Warren to to go all the way up to the edge of income inequality and uh, you know uh, health care, but not take the leap to the solution. That's just sinful because that just lulls the Democratic Party into you know self being self satisfied. It, it, I mean, yes, I know. There's a homeless problem. Yes, it's terrible. Right. It's caused by, uh, you know, the uh, mental health problem. And yes, and it's caused by, you know, uh, rents are too high. Yes, it's terrible. It's terrible. But what do, what do we do about it? Well, you know, that's complicated. No, exactly. But, you know. I, I think that that's exactly... I have to just well actually make your point, and then I'm going to go on a quick tangent before we get off. Well, I mean, I go think ahead. that like that dynamic you're describing is why we're in the situation that we're in, both when it comes to the Democratic Party's re, uh, relationship with the Republican Party and also their relationship with Bernie Sanders. It's like when you're when you want to score points by simply acknowledging the problem, like weaponizing the silence of the Republican Party on things like racism or sexism or like uh, homelessness or mental health or any of these other. Any, th any of these like sort of numerous societal issues we have, you have to kind of be, you know, essentially using a far right party as your foil, people who won't even acknowledge the existence of these problems. So then you come out ahead, you say, hey, you know what? You see those stupid, you know, morons on the far right. Forget the fact that they like they basically roll us every week. Forget right. that they roll yeah. us every those, week. You know those yeah. fucking idiots and who beat us who, all the time. Who like just fucking like <laughs> ass them, like yeah. who just like just uh, you fucking know those morons who win every single who, major conflict we yeah. have. With who them. hand yeah. us who <laughs> hand us our ass every week. You know those people like they don't even believe in racism or sex. And they don't even know what intersectionality is. Like like but we do. We're the smart. We're the morally righteous. The morally superior party and they're but just that's the dumbest the psychic but that's, payoff there's a, that's another problem is that so yeah. many people in that coalition on the comfortable parts of the coalition they don't that's all they want yeah they don't care about the material change because then the fact you know? that that's the emotional component of it but what that does it creates a very hostile relationship with the far left the people to the left of them in, a, in like in a if not hostile if not like friendly uh you know a rivalry with the far right because those people can be used as an intellectual and moral foil because they're like the entire you know, basis for their disagreement is all can be, exist on the symbolic level. It can be right. okay. We acknowledge that racism is a problem. We acknowledge this, but for like, but using climate change as an example, it's like they want to do the same thing with climate change. They want to say we acknowledge the science of climate change. Republican Party, they're stupid. They they lack the intelligence. They they're scientifically illiterate. They think that you know dinosaurs lived a thousand years ago. We acknowledge the climate change, the science of climate change. We believe the consensus of those scientists. Well, what do you want to do about it? It's like, <laughs> well, you know, the Green New Deal. That's a little bit far. That's a little bit, you know, uh, radical. We would, per, you know, like carbon tax or, you know, some kind of offset. We'll plant, mm -hmm. a, we'll plant a tree for, right. we'll plant a tree for every mine we, for every uh, mountain we strip mine. Like that, like acknowledging the science of climate change, but then not really having the same level of, uh, you know, essentially drive to stop it. It doesn't make you seem smarter than the far right. You seem dumber. Like it seems makes you seem dumber to say I acknowledge the problem and the scope of the problem and the cause of the problem, but I'm not really in favor of the solution. It's well, better. it's it, coherent. I mean, yeah. it's coherent. I, I I have to just say really quick before we get off. Uh, I I saw one time. I wish I could remember the context, but also the other thing about liberals in Vietnam is there's this like weird. Um, they because they're establishment about it and they can't just acknowledge that the thing was evil and a structural part of u.s foreign policy or whatever they have this 
they a lot of them who didn't go and fight really have this weird inferiority complex. That's why they had this bizarre yes. worship of people like John McCain, and that's why they thought that like you know John Kerry would be a slam dunk over George W. Bush, even though George W. Bush was like, hey, yeah, I got out of it. Now you're windsurfing, pussy. Like you know, which is yeah. how it actually works in real politics. But I remember one time hey, on you know Hardball, what? I'd rather be in I'd rather be in Da Nang than have to sleep with Teresa Hines. But go ahead. <laughs> I actually disagree with that. Um, I right. I watched the uh, I watched um, it was a hardball once, and some somebody Chris Matthews was on some like Vietnam contingent, and I forget the guests, but she kind of was just like, you know, basically doing the sort of like thing that you do at Matthews, where you're just like, okay, I don't know about that, Chris. I think maybe blah 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 blah. And he's just like, no, Vietnam was a very deep thing, particularly for the men of that generation. It's a certain thing. It's an emotional resonance, and it was Vietnam. And anyways, it was Vietnam, and that's why the, that's why there's John McCain. Right. <laughs> that impression was so good. My ear is covered in spit. I don't know how you did that. Hey, you know what? I know. I know you want to. We got to run, David. Finish, but, but can I just make a suggestion? Sure. And I'm being serious. Yes. Forget Medicare for all. Uh, VA, mm. Veterans Affairs for all. Bring back the draft. And that's just because I hate my children. Everybody should have to serve in the military or the Peace Corps or AmeriCorps. Two years of your life. Everybody. Everybody in public service, you do that, and then you're entitled to VA benefits. So it should be VA for all. All right, David, Medicare this is very. I, 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 hear, I, I see the. I see you uh, at the pavilion watching a JFK speech right now, David. I don't get. But that was very sixties oh, oh, in Milwaukee. Yeah, well, well some. I don't know. You're, it's just very JFK of you. Anyways, David Feldman. I love you. I love you. Sub guys. Subscribe. Are we still on, or is this? Is this, is this <laughs> All right, bye bye. <laughs> subscribe to the David Feldman Show. He's such a troll. Subscribe to the David Feldman Show on iTunes. All right, we really gotta get to post game. We're running Ray late, so we're gonna have a little bit of a shorter post game than usual. Patreon.com/slash/tmbs. Grab your tickets to the Bell House. Tmbs.fm. Brandon. Oh, yeah. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Pretty Bad Lefty, and you can listen to my podcast on SoundCloud. It's called The Discourse. It's also on iTunes and Spotify. They let me on all of the, the outlets. That's so surprising. And you can become a patron of it, which I have, and you should, too. You should definitely become a patron of the uh, You can, you know, I can afford better, like, nicer sweaters. It's a nice sweater. See you oh, guys in the post game. <laughs> <laughs>